Also, the kids get a title. It's not like just you and him. about vision a little bit. I think we say we, it's fair to say that we seamlessly, I like this quote from uh, Sarah Ann Cooper, which is, we seamlessly process objects, words, shapes, colors, movement, and faces simultaneously within milliseconds. 
with a mechanism rarely, if at all, flipping into our consciousness. Perhaps because of the apparent ease with which we are able to see, we live with the illusion that seeing is easy. So it's an incredibly well-developed sense, which is still we're looking out at the world, and it's just there. But we're really not looking out, we're only taking information in. That's only one way, it's this way. We close our eyes and we don't see it, it's not because, it's not because uh, we're not looking out, it's because we're not, we stop taking information in. Properly. And out of three million nerve fibers that come to our brain, uh, from all the senses in our body, two million are coming out of our eyeballs. Two million. And it really does affect uh, our consciousness. I'll just show you this little, this little clip before we move on. Um, I've never seen it before, but uh, it still works in the same way. If you know how it works, it still works. Let's just open it up over here. It really is to show us how dominant vision is in our consciousness. One moment, we are being bombarded by sensory information. Our brains do a remarkable job of making sense of it all. It seems easy enough to separate the sounds we hear from the sights we see. But there is one illusion that reveals this isn't always the case. Have a look at this. What do you hear? But look what happens when we change the picture. And yet, the sound hasn't changed. In every clip, you are only ever hearing bar with a B. It's an illusion known as the McGurk effect. Take another look. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. So um, the mouth will be So uh, there you have it. Uh, <laughs> vision is very dominant in our consciousness to the point where we're going to go with who is going to go with vision. That's why when you're sitting on the bus and the bus next to you move, you will go with vision, even though you sense your body says you're not moving. So you always have a vision. Vision is developed to give us the best. Uh, it's not like having the first form, but ultimately it's vision then to take over. So I don't need to touch the carpet to know what it feels like. I don't need to walk from here to the wall to understand that this because once I walk, so I walk. And so, uh, you know, that's how the uh, vision eventually becomes dominant. We need to rely on vision because it's the, it takes up most of our brain. We have a three million nerve fibers going to our brain. And uh, we build this internal representation of the external reality. What do, we, what do we call that internal representation of the external reality? Fact. We call it what? Fact. Fact, really. Yeah, we call it our life, really. That's what we're doing. We're living towards the internal representation of the external reality. And the subject we're talking about this evening about vision and learning is a very important one because about eight, up to 80% of the class work involves the use of vision. But more than that, 100%. 100% of the uh, words we read um, have to come through the visual system. And so that's a really the thing we can't get around. So when we talk about good vision, you know, what is good vision? Most people in the street will say, well, it's 2020. Right? So what does 2020 or 6 say? What does that mean? Someone says, well, he's got 2020 vision. What does that mean? Yeah, what does it tell us about his, his eyesight? It tells us he can see small from far. <clears throat> Um, which is not so much use when you we, we really want to know oh, how comfortable it is to see near. There's a lot of questions we need to answer. It doesn't about, anything about his reading? Nothing, nothing. It's true that nothing on the page is smaller than the 6 6, which is why you're going to get position papers the American Academy of Ophthalmology telling you that if you kick and see 6 6, then there's no connection, reason why you're not learning well. Should have anything to do with vision? As if all there is to about vision is 6 6. Or what it is, that's just how small you can see from far. We're going to look to see different vision skills 
we'll understand there's a lot more to vision that needs to be examined if I want to be able to uh, get it all clear to a child and strike this to read, than just uh, six six. So that would be not seen so clearly. What I want to say this evening as well should be very clear to you that I'm not, we're going to speak about a number of signs and symptoms of this child who's struggling to read. And you could have many causes, like it could be idiopathic, it doesn't have to be vision. But it's worth looking at vision first. So I like to use this sort of uh, parable of a computer which isn't working every time I hit G on the keyboard, H is what comes up on the screen, and I get my technician to come around and he works for two and a half hours looking for hard drive. And uh, he says, doesn't seem to be a problem there. And uh, he says, oh, I've got to hold on a second. He says, I've got a keyboard in the car. And off he goes to the car, brings the keyboard down, hooks it up, hits the G, and what's on the screen? G. Ah, problems with the keyboard, right? There you go. Here's the bill for three hours' work. And I say, no, thank you very much. You didn't, you didn't work in a, in a reasonable fashion. You worked backwards. You went first with the hard drive and then the keyboard. So what happens when we send the kids for a neuro? didactic or psychodidactic or whatever value they're doing through the visual system. And we don't know if the visual system is neutral in that evaluation. Because we do not know whether the vision skills are efficient enough to meet the visual demand of the evaluation and are therefore neutral in that evaluation. That's a very big problem. It's a very serious problem. We all would not say, okay, here, Moshe, take these glasses, it's really going to make things hard for you. Come on, wear those for evaluation. So we can't do that. Now, how do you know that Moshe is not sitting there with that sort of pair of eyes? Is it because he sees 6-6? Six, six? Because yesterday some doctor said he sees 6-6? Six, six? So that doesn't tell you that he's neutral in that evaluation. And that's a very serious problem. This is the uh, timeline of reading in the book Proust and the Street by Professor Marianne Wolfe, who I've been in quite a few lecture together last summer at a conference on uh, cognitive modifiability and neuroplasticity. Uh, I've been in touch with her quite a bit. This is from her book. And um, what's nice about this is that, um, is that it shows us, this is a timeline from 0 to uh, 600 milliseconds. And here the word appears, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. I mean, but for Marianne Wolfe, until she met me, she sort of said, okay, the word appears. Now she sort of understands that that's a whole process, right? He does it when the word appears and then it starts from there. Let's just get the word to appear in our consciousness. It's not a simple matter at all. But once the word appears, we have the visual area responds over here. We go visual areas, we're looking at visual feature analysis in the frontal cortex as well. And maybe a visual word form area, if you recognize the word because it's already a word which is already read, then there'll be a group of neurons that are going to fire and we will perceive that word without having to look at every detail of the word. So we sort of hijack this area, which is made for visual form analysis of trees and faces and things like that. We use it for reading. The opening line of Marion Wolf's book is that man was never intended to read. We were never intended to read. But if you look at the brain, there is no reading area of the brain. So you see the kids got dyslexia. You can't say, well, there's a problem with the reading area, because there is no reading area. There's a language area, there's a speech area, but there is no reading area. The demon, the demon. And so what I want you to, to see over here um, is that it's only after 150 milliseconds that we actually start using perhaps some semantic and phenomenological processing. Even maybe at 150 milliseconds, if I recognize the word, I'll use some semantic and phenomenological, and you know, I'll say something which has to do with sound. But what I, what I find when I lecture to the teachers in Oran and Fekene, etc., is everyone's pumped with this. We're going to talk about it a lot this evening, why that is. But everyone's pumped with information that's phonological, 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 phonological difficulties. But I want everyone to hear to understand for the first 150 milliseconds, there is nothing phonological going on whatsoever when a child is trying to read. The process is 100% visual. It's 100% visual. I need to know the visual system is working well. If anything thereafter is actually going to happen appropriately. Otherwise, I'm already starting off on the wrong foot. More or less, that statement will be modified to some degree a little later on. But we need to get that. This is ignored. Ignored. Everything that's gone on for the first 150 minutes of it is ignored in the world of learning disabilities, dyslexia, etc. Et and we'll talk about why that is. 
but you, you need to know there's a whole world going on, 250 milliseconds, it's all visual, and we need to know that's happening well. Because as I say, we're never reading the word on the page. We are only ever reading the word that shows up in our consciousness. And as a, as a teacher, you have to be sensitive to that. When you're reading with this kid and he's skipping and he's jumping and he's what, what's going on over there? Like, I can see it. Why can't he see it? Because it just means it's showing up in your consciousness and it's not showing up in his consciousness. I mean, none of you have thought about vision like that. But that's it. Like, we're just getting it in. And that's, we hope we're getting it in well. But we're only responding to what we're getting in. That's, that's, that's true of where the ball is, right? The kid who stands in occupational therapy trying to catch that ball, but he doesn't know where the ball is. So, you know, you can tell him information, move quicker, move slower, but if you he he'll get his eyes on the ball, maybe he'll be able to see where the ball is. <coughs> so there are different approaches to reading. There's a phonetic approach, there's a whole language approach, there's sight reading approach. But all these methods start with figuring out what the word is, which I think is probably about stage five or six in the process of reading. Because what we need to know first is where is the word. So when I come onto the page, I need to have some sort of area of visual attention. Area of visual attention. Maybe one of the mums is coming here this evening, but I examined her child and made some incredible changes. She was, his area of visual attention was maybe the smallest I've ever seen in my life. I expect to send him for visual field testing which now you know, he managed to get, and the doctor said he wouldn't be able to do it, but now he's got a huge area of it. When I came in, I had whole fingers even here. He couldn't tell me how many fingers on this side and this side. He's like looking at things in a very small area of visual attention. Now, if you do that, you can't know where anything is. You just see the word you're looking at. That's what exists in your consciousness. So you're looking at the board, you look back, and then you where was I, where was I? Well, why doesn't where feature? Of course, where isn't something most eye exams check, your ability to understand where things are. But it's key if you want to copy off the board and find your place on the page. And then you need to say, well, where is the next word? Right? If I can't move my eyes comfortably across the page, then I'm gonna I need to know where is the next word. That means when the word appears, I'm looking at one word, and in my peripheral awareness there's another word there. My brain is working out the meaning of that space in order to prime myself to make the motor movement to get in the first third of the next word if I'm reading in English. We'll talk about Hebrew and English as that's what we're here for. But I want you to understand, I've heard these things from Professor Keith Rayner. Now Keith Rayner is the world expert in uh, eye movements. I, uh, in his paper is eye movements in reading 20 years of research. 20 years of research, a lot of research, right? It's a very, very complicated and abnormal thing we need to learn. So it's abnormal because when we look with something with our fovea, it's normally sustained. It normally carries on. But when we when we read, we need to look at the word and then suppress that image. And there's a whole thing of timing going on with a magnocellular timing. Uh, two uh, people from Oxford University, Talcott and Stein, wrote a paper on this, the magnocellular hypothesis. A lot of neurological timing that needs to go on. A lot has been spoken about about this timing, whether that's the cause of dyslexia. Um, so I just said, you know, think about Braille, sleeping letters with your finger. You know, does it matter? When does it matter? Does it matter if your eyes, does it matter if our eyes skip? Can I keep my two eyes aligned accurately on the word? Can I maintain focus on the word and see it clearly? Well, these are all things which I need before I start to repeat. And of course, having 6'6 six, six isn't going to answer the question. But I have all these things which I need before I start to repeat. So I need to have eye tracking, I need to have eye focusing, I need to have eye teaming, I need to be able to do that in a sustained way, I need to be able to do that in a sustained way, which leaves me free enough to carry out cognitive tasks at the same time. Should we take notes? You're going to give out a handout? So a lot of the symptoms, the main symptoms and signs are on my website. I've got handouts from Hebrew. And, um, yeah, is it, that should you, be enough as well. Can you upload this to slide chat? Sorry? It's on the slide channel. It's being recorded now. It's on my YouTube channel now. I'll probably edit bits and pieces. Um, we'll see if the camera is picking up my voice well enough. This not. entire uh, lecture is being on YouTube. Yeah, I, last time I had the camera much closer, which was less convenient for me. So we'll see when I listen at the end if the, if the sound was good enough about this. So it's a new camera position. 
It's not on the other mic, but yeah, so I can't promise you. So it's good you're here. It's good you're here anyway. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It's much better live than, than YouTube. So we're going to look at some of these vision skills, right? Some of these vision skills, so you can understand what they are. Um, so this is eye tracking skills. It's important to listen to the conversation between this child and his father as well. To get a sense of where he is emotionally. Come now. Come now. I'm just asking him to move from, look from target to target. I don't tell him how I'd like him to do it. But clearly, if you want to be a reader, you need to be at a stage where you're moving your eye independently. You know? Because the fine assignment that you can make in your entire body is in your eye. And if you can't do that, you can't make a fine enough movement with your head so you're stuck. Of course, every patient you see here has either been told there's nothing wrong, I think most ones you see here are nothing wrong. My entire patient base is people have been told there's nothing wrong or nothing to do. That's it. That's everyone I see. Nothing wrong, nothing to do. Or, yeah, or you're, you've had treatment and you're fine. So I won't be like that today. So we'll be finished. It's like, you've never done anything. It's just still at the beginning. And we'll talk about that. But anyway. <laughs> lots to talk about. So, this is the conversation. Okay. Well, this ball is always in his consciousness, this kid. There is nothing beyond. So he doesn't know you don't want to move your head? He said, I do know that. Now I tell him, just move your eyes. I need to learn how to do it. 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 So that's a basic you know, eye tracking test. It doesn't go anywhere near the demand of reading, but it's a nice screener. Because if you pass that test, it doesn't mean you're good enough. It doesn't mean you're good enough for reading. It just means if you fail that test, you're really not good enough for reading. So you have the question, Richard? Why is he like this? What is that? So it's a, probably a visual manifestation of a motor general pervasive motor difficulty. So it may have been through it may have been through occupational therapy and they worked on his other tasks, but they didn't work on the finest of the fine motor, which is visual. And they may have tried to do a lot of fine motor work with his hand and visually guided motor tasks without making sure that the visual part can guide the hand. So the cutting and the writing and all that. Until this is happening, that's not going to happen so well. So now, this after seven weeks of therapy, you know, it's a different story. He's, he's, on the, he's okay, this kid. We need to make big circles. He's, happy. he's a happy camper. Um, so now let's look at um, focusing. I'll just show you this one briefly. But this is the amplitude of the conversation. You know, as I see it, this is the Vidika. They talk about you know to work and you could, which I really disdain. It sounds like pizza, right? Take something small, but you know, vision skills are all huge. It's consciousness, really. How conscious am I of the world through my visual system? That's what I'm trying to look at. So we're looking at focusing, and I bring this machine, this little square, this these words up there up this uh, little pole thing and bring it towards her eye. She's meant to tell you when it's blurred and when it becomes clear again, which should be about here at her age, like for a 15-year-old. She's down like at a 40-year-old level. Her whole system sort of collapsed. Um, and this is the one test, actually, which is never carried out. I've never seen any patient here who, why do that tell you? Well, yeah, I did this man. And no one carries it out because in the books, it's written that children shouldn't have a focus on them. So amplitude of accommodation is assumed to be normally young people and problematic when you hit 45. Another important point there is to think that what happens between the ages of 15 when it starts to go down till 45? The question isn't, isn't, is it clear or not clear? The question is how much am I paying for my pictures, as I will show you later. This is a young lad, of course, was told everything's fine, but when you watch how his two eyes come together, even you will be able to see now one eye doesn't come in so You see that? The right eye, yes, you see that, right? So, you know, it's like a bit of a no-brainer. Of course, it's a bit shocking to the parents when they can see it too. They're not quite sure what happened to the eye exam, but that's a different story. 
Now, what I want you to see here is a child who has the same child who had the focusing difficulty, who as a result, as well, cannot convert. I mean, there's the connect of those two things. So you'd imagine you check the focusing if someone had poor conversions, but again, it's assumed to be normal. And then they say the problem is with weak muscles. Now, I want you to see here, once there's no problem with the muscles. You're going to see the medial rectus muscle will turn the eye all the way in, and it will turn the eye all the way in the other way. But the two eyes together will not come in. So it's a coordination problem, something else, but it's not eye muscle. It's not weak muscles. Now, if it's weak muscles, you think it's weak muscles, you treat it on the basis of weak muscles, you're going to solve the problem. Because you're not treating what the problem is. So we have to see over here, as the eyes come across all the way in. And then the other eye, just cover. And this one, that's thick. So the eye comes all the way in. Each eye comes all the way in, no problem. And so they come down. But it doesn't come together. Thick. You see, the eye has not come together. But, you know, luckily there's also a happy ending, I think, for this young lady. Can you say your name? So don't, don't say your name. Tell what 10 takeaway 2 is. That's great. I asked that cash question, 10 takeaway 2, because I need to know that she can use her eyes and her head at the same time. Because if you just use your eyes, you don't train with cognitive loading at the same time, then all you end up at the end with is a party trick. Party trick meaning I couldn't cross my eyes, now I can cross my eyes. But what's happening when I'm reading across the page? I'm trying to do comprehension. Can I still hold my eyes together? Oh no. No one checked that I'd be able to do that when I left. So if you're dealing with something like perhaps orthoptics, which is a discipline which I studied in university, which doesn't deal with information, information processing, or life per se, it's very eyeball orientated, then the result is not going to produce the desired result because it's not doing what it's not going to result, produce a result which is relevant as it were, to, to life itself. Now what I want you to see here as well, in this case, is a little kid who um, is not able to cross his eyes. You'll see his right eye does not come out. Hashtags. Hashtags. So his right eye is not coming in. And then five seconds later, five seconds later, I change the task. And instead of him just looking at the stick, I give him a, a um, straw. I hold the straw, and he has to put the stick in the straw. So it's moved from being a, OK, I don't really care where the stick is task, to I'm hunting. And why do we have two eyes? We have two eyes only to know where things are, so I can make a motor response to them in the wild, so I can hunt and grab and catch. That's what two eyes give me. So let me just show you that, and then I'll talk about that a little bit. So now you're going to see five seconds later how that eye which wasn't coming in at all. There it is, all the way in. You see that, right? Right in. So what does that mean? It means that he wants to survive, and his survival mechanism works just fine. Like when he has to actually put a stick in a straw, he's able to do that. So I know when he's reading, he's not going to be able to do that because I don't care where the word is on the z-axis. I mean, the benefit of using two eyes when reading, using two eyes together when reading, is only the avoidance of double vision, which is so not, it's so not what we're built for. That's not why we have two eyes. So when, when we hunt or catch, so I'm actually pushing the right neurological button to bring those two eyes into action. What about what I'm reading? That's why we, when we do optometric vision therapy, we develop the visual systems at a ridiculously high level of convergence. Because I need to know that I can do this ridiculously high level of convergence where I'm not even, the real reason for me to use my two eyes together does not exist when I'm reading. Because the real thing which would get my brain to use two eyes together is I need to hunt or push or touch something and know where it is so I can make the motor movement. The other point I think is very important over here is when I'm doing vision therapy. Like if you don't know this thing, which I'm telling you, that you, you know, people don't know this. They don't know that you can take a stick to a kid's eyes and you cannot converge and then you give them something to put in and it happens. So because people don't know that, how do you start working with a child like that? So this child in my office where I was working with him to develop his vision skills to meet the visual demands of reading, I would start with a stick in the straw. So I got a starting point and get the system used to doing that and then, then take it to the next level. So it's a very important point in terms of therapy to have the knowledge to be able to 
to, to move forward. That was actually, that point, the first time I read it, was written by Frederick Brock, who actually worked in Staten Island and uh, started doing development of optometry in 1942. And he wrote and did a tremendous amount of research in 1942 and 1965, read all his papers. And he's quite an incredible man. He did a lot for, for in terms of developing the theory behind vision therapy. And it's not new, you know, you see, 1942, I mean, the development of optometry started in 1927. So it's not something which is new, it's something which is quite old. This has always been amongst a small number of uh, crazy people <laughs> who, are, who are very passionate and want to really get, you know, take vision to the end, which is a, a far bigger step than seeing if people can see uh, 2020 on the, on, the, uh, on the leather chart. The same mother uh, mentioned to me today, I was sure my child had ADD and that was it. Today it's all over, she said today. He's uh, eight, uh, maybe 22 weeks in therapy, finished. I mean, he's just a completely different person. Like someone else is sort of top neurologist uh, of great repute. Uh, I've actually asked her to write a little letter about that. But also, ADD, no question, Ritalin. And Dr. David Granick, he looked at his patient base and he found uh, within the 266 patients he had with ADHD, <coughs> there was three times as many who had convergence insufficiency as compared to his normal patient base. So which made him start to think, well maybe there's a misdiagnosis, maybe I'm doing the TOVA test or the MOXO test with the visual system which is interfering with the child's ability to perform properly on that test, you're not really getting a clear picture of what their areas of attention in their brain are, are able to do, because vision is interfering with that. And again, this is a very serious problem. I mean, it is serious, but you think it's medication, you don't need it. And that's not a little bit. And it's like because of maybe those with ADHD are more likely to have uh, conversion decisions. Well, that's a that's a good this what they found is that uh, we think it's the other way around. The kids with conversions and sufficiency will have ADHD like behaviors. Mm -hmm. And if you film on the DSM four, which is now DSM five, it's the same list of symptoms of ADD is gonna it's gonna be with conversions and sufficiency. And we can treat conversions and sufficiency as well. And so that doesn't mean it's exclusive, it doesn't mean you can't have both. It does doesn't really it. help them converge? Sorry? Does Ritalin help them converge? No, Ritalin does not help them converge. No. no. So here's a little picture of the eyeball, right? I never know quite why this picture comes up, why I have it. I don't know, but it really gives so much information, but I think in an eyeball, actually, we only see these have an eyeball, it's all about vision. <laughs> so we'll move on. <laughs> so here's the eye, here's the lens, this is what we use for focusing. I think the important point I do point out is that for the kids with. Um, uh, with children have Down syndrome, 70% of the serious focusing problem. If you work with children with Down syndrome, you should expect them to be wearing bifocals. If they're not wearing bifocals, they don't have a separate pair of reading glasses, then you can assume they're not getting the most out of the lesson you're trying to teach them. Uh, how to diagnose and how to test a child with Down syndrome is a lot of skill. Unfortunately, because of, this, because of the development of computerized testing for prescriptions, where the people put their head in the machine and read your prescription, uh, practitioners are becoming less and less proficient at using what we call a retinoscope, a little light where you can check someone's prescription, uh, even if they're hugging their mother who's standing with her back to me, but the kid's head is over the shoulder, and in a few seconds I can find out their prescription. You need to be trained at doing that and practice, well practiced. And it's a serious problem again because they, no, you can't put a special needs kid in one of those machines, they, they're not going to be happy with that. Uh, so there's the focusing, and that's the retina, and the image falls on the phobia and goes down the optic nerve to the brain and we get to the level of processing which we spoke about before. So this is a funny picture because we don't expect children to be able to read and we sort of know that it's a biologically, perhaps a biologically unacceptable task. I mean, most people I see are good enough to pick apples off the tree. That they can do. I mean, most people who I see have vision skills which meet the visual demands of picking apples off the tree. But they don't have the visual skills which meet the visual demands of reading the ones that I see. So we have different skills, right? We have vision skills for building the cues, for driving, for playing tennis, playing sleep, for learning to read, or copying and reading to learn. I think many eye exams are somewhere down here. So they're not really probing the person's ability to function at the things they want to be doing on a day to day. So I like to compare uh, the vision skills for reading to swimming 100 meters freestyle in 46.91 seconds, which is the world record. So if we suddenly said all people have to swim um, 100 meter freestyle, 46.91 seconds, we're going to find a lot of people can't do that. Not because of emotional reasons, but because of physiological reasons, pure physiological reasons. And we would expect that would be the major reason why people will fail. 
And if you do want to see 100 meters of water in 60 seconds, you have to do some pretty unnatural things. You have to neutralize the natural sim asymmetry which there is in your body, right? Everyone's got a stronger right hand and a stronger left hand, or a stronger left hand. And if you want to swim at world record level, you need to break down the asymmetry there is between two, which is unnatural. So that swimming 100 meters in 46.91 seconds is unnatural. And so just as Professor Marion Wolf said that vision reading is a biologically unacceptable task from the point of brain, so I think that reading is a biologically unacceptable task from the point of eyes. So we spoke about those eye movements, which are pretty unnatural. They're learned. They're learned. And we've seen that, we've seen that, uh, you know, those are learned. We've seen that the focusing system, actually, that the muscles around that eyeball that we looked at before are actually smooth muscles, which are made for intermittent periodic use, not for sustained use, not like in our arms, like more like the muscles in our in our uh, intestine or wind or food pipe. So for occasional use. So we need to work with that. And the divergence we're using, how precisely my two eyes have to team up. So if I'm looking at apple and I'm picking off the tree, if my two eyes are not perfectly lined on an apple, it doesn't bother me. That's okay. But if my two eyes aren't perfectly aligned on the word, that's really going to mess things up. There's a level of precision required in the movements and the stability. We spoke about the stability. I've got two eyes for hunting, not for exactly looking together, moving exactly. That doesn't, you don't have to do that in the real world. You just don't have to do that. Oh, but you want to read? You want to swim 100 meters and 40, 46 and you, you have to do some pretty unusual things if you want to be excellent at it. We sort of explained why 80% of all the guitar and style of kids with learning difficulties have a visual component. So I don't, I don't like to think that they have problems, many of these. I think some, a lot of them just have, well, here's their visual system. Oh, they want to do this crazy thing called reading? Okay, there's a gap between where they, what they've got and what they need. Some people are closer to the ideal. Some people are further from the ideal. And in the simplest sense, that's the way I like to look at it. Do you need, do most have exact symmetry? between the two eyes, well, if it's good enough, maybe they'll be able to move their eyes together across the page. But if one eye is really working much better than the other eye, then they're not going to be able to move their eyes across the page. So let's look at, let's look how tracking, let's look at some of those um, skills. Uh, we'll get to tracking in a second. Let's just go over this. We, we say the eye is like a camera. Well, we have two eyes, so that's hard to get them to work together, as I said. We need to know, is the picture blurred, or is the picture clear? We need to know, have I got this beautiful camera that's like that child we saw before? There's no control over it. So it's like having a, you know, a gorilla taking my wedding videos. I've got a beautiful camera, but the gorilla can't really control it so well. Well, that's like, a, that's like the kid we saw before. I mean, no one's looking at that. No one's looking at that. How well is the control of the camera? It sounds like so people, you know, people leave the stage and think, how can it be? But it is. We all know it is. We all know no one is looking at the control of the camera. Everything is assumed. You can see 6-6 six, six on the chart. You're, everything is great. You can be a payas. That's what they hear, right? You probably can't be. A, can you be a talmid? Right. But that's the question which most people want answered. That's not being answered. So, and the other is how much of the picture is costing them. What do I mean by that? So here we have a, a child like we saw before having had a cognitive task, and this time you'll see how the eyes will play around when I ask the questions. <laughs> Parents always help. Great. <laughs> there are some offers, you know, the parents in the room for vision therapy says, well, how they decided to have, you know, you know, I go to the conference every year since 1999, which is always wonderful because you have these conversations. Say, well, how have you decided you can keep the parents in the vision therapy? So it goes like this. You ask the child to look, you put the Marsden ball, this is the Marsden ball, this is a Cuban Marsden ball. You put it down without this level, and you ask the child to sit under, lie under the Marsden ball with the ball directly above the middle of the chest. That's all you ask them to do. And you see how much the parents telling the kid, move left, move right, move right. Like if they open their mouth, they say, go out. Right. <laughs> so they can sit and watch. That's, that's, that's fine. <laughs> so you saw how the eyes here are playing in and out. Right, you saw that because he needs thinking and looking. So the pictures are costing him too much. So it's like a child who, well, we'll go through the signs and symptoms later. Uh, I think we should pretty much get through all the things we need. So we need our first uh, 
activity for this evening. First volunteer. That's just not exactly perfect. But if you could, you're going to be, what's your name all the time? David. If you could volunteer for us, thank you very much. And uh, to read up and down with the arrows. And what David is going to read is going to appear on the screen in front of us. So I'm giving David a, 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 an eye movement which he's not used to making. And what I want you to think of, particularly those who work in education, if we would hear David, someone read like David's going to read now, how many of us would say the problem is visual? Or how many have gone straight to the world of phonological decoding, you know, phonology? So off you go. We'll put it up on the screen. Please, yeah, David. You want me to read? Yeah. The way, the way it is here, up and down. Oh. This exercise was designed to uh, force. Get to go to the top oh. there. Oh, I see. To uh, force you to. I'll show you on the screen after. To this force you to move your eyes in a direction, you know, in a different way uh, while reading as you are. You see how we skip the full stop there whilst reading full stop. No, oh, don't cheat, don't cheat. Awesome. <laughs> as you are uh, with children, uh, as you are with, chil with children, as you read this, as you, oh, as you read, well, where's the D? Oh, I see. As you read this, mm -hmm. think of the children uh, with with poor eye movement skills. Does it seem logical that they <laughs> more trouble with That's fine. Right. Yeah. They don't want to Do you know what you read? It's pretty horrible. Do you know what you read? Yeah, I did. You did. So a lot of people read that, they learn to actually know what they read as well. Because it's just a change. Yeah, that's really hard. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great reader, and I, that's all I do. And that was really hard. <laughs> And it was hard for two reasons. Yeah. One is you didn't know what the words would look like. So you didn't recognize right. the word like that. So good readers know what words look like. And the other thing was the eye tracking. Your eyes are not trained to make those sort of movements, so you skip. It sounds like looking at a word find. Yeah. And you don't realize that you can look at the diagonal Correct. up, going up. Correct. And you keep looking at the word, and you just don't see it. Right. So, you know, again, you hear kids reading poorly all the time, but not people don't think vision. They think first language when you really difficulties like that. So that's what David read, uh, starting from down there. This exercise, of course, he's familiar with the items, etc., etc. So that's a that's a reliable one. Um, this is one of the tests we use for um, for eye eye function, let's say. And what is nice is got a it's got a first part of the test. We're going to read the numbers up and down like this. And you know, you'll see this child here is going to do very well. Let's just uh, get him going. Ah, <laughs> Okay, so he was very fast. But when we come to the next part of the test, um, he's going to read along in this test. He's going to go So, same child, right? So you've seen how quickly he's able to read those numbers. Skip. So Chinese. Yeah, well, up and down is not a problem for most kids. But again, what I want you to see is a nice test because it keeps the 
the language element constant, uh, rapid automatic naming, and yet you throw in a whole visual element, and it really does, you know, it does really be able to make the differentiation of this speech, is it vision? Right, so then I spend the rest of the evaluation finding exactly what the problem is vision is. Good developmental eye movement test, but it doesn't correspond exactly with eye movement ability, but it includes everything. And so uh, it's a very excellent uh, screener as well. That's what it's like to see double. And I saw a child uh, only three weeks ago who was told to come here uh, by Mrs. Beverly Griffiths, who's a uh, well, headmistress of Renown, was a family friend. And uh, he, he came, and uh, in the first minute of the exam, I saw that even though he had correct decisions for distance, his eyes were tending to cross at mid. And he's a child who's gone through a lot of evaluations, I think, of leaving the school, actually. You know, it could be for many different reasons, but he's certainly not. He's a bright boy. And then we asked him, you know, well, I, I said, how do you feel when you do you ever see double? Yeah. Do you ever tell anyone? But the mom says, well, how do you feel when you read? He says, I feel like my brain's hurting. That's what he said. I feel like my brain's hurting. So let's talk about good posture for reading. Um, can I just read that? Yeah. Good evening. Please observe how I choose to hold this sheet. I have chosen to hold it parallel to my face and not parallel to the ground. Not only I prefer to read like this, all people prefer to read this way. Therefore, I ask, why do we continue to, to allow our children to read with the book flat on the table and not from a bookstand? Thank you very much. We didn't organize this before. Right? Sorry? We didn't organize this before. No. No. We've never failed in 23 years of lecturing. Uh, that's how we want to read. So why do we keep giving our kids the book when it's flat on the table? We have to change that. It changes the whole posture. This is a page, book paper from uh, uh, 1959 by Daryl Boyd Harmon. Uh, he did a lot of research on what's the best way to read. It's certainly not like that. That's not so much fun. It's cute for the pictures, but look, he's probably reading 10 centimeters. Think about the effort he's making to focus. He's setting himself up nicely to need glasses, to look into eyes. The script is going to go higher and higher and higher. That's a different lecture, but that's what's happening. He's having a really hard time converging. So he'd do a lot better if he uh, if he was able to read with the sloping surface. He'd probably double his working distance and half the effort and increase the processing because he frees himself up and be able to do a lot more. See, when you halve the effort, when you take out the price of the pictures, you actually do more. I saw a child today for a re-evaluation. She's a week 12, I think, out of 18. And so I see there any sort of changes? So yeah, maths. You're so much better at maths. Have we worked on maths here? I haven't said a single number or any mathematics at all. But when you free up vision, you can leave your brain free because vision is what you're going to throw, like we saw before, the initial Move it, your brain's going to throw everything at vision because that's survival. So it doesn't leave room for the other things if vision's not working so well. So you get these really nice profound changes. So we'll just run through these quite quickly because they're on my website. But <coughs> in Hebrew, anyway, reading better when the text is bigger is a really big sign that the kid has got a learning, learning and vision aspect is very important. Having trouble remembering what was read, understanding better when read too. So the child reads accurately but does not understand what he reads. David managed to understand it this evening, but a lot of people, as I say, will read that will not have a clue what they read, despite the fact they read it quite accurately. But if the child cannot read, understand what he read, reading, but he can understand what's being read too, then it's not got a language problem. His eyes feel sore when reading or doing close work, or he loses the place when reading. He loses the place when reading. So let's see how good your tracking is. Some of you might have done an exercise like this before, but I'm sure some of you have not. What you're going to see is two groups of people, one wearing uh, a black team and a white team. And what we want to see is how many times the white team pass the basketball to each other. Okay, that's all we want to see. How many times the white team pass the basketball to each other. We're going to see how well you track. So you're going to have to tell them at the end, how many times was the pass made? White team passing the basketball. Are you ready? Starts quite suddenly. Are you ready? Fantastic. How many times the white team pass? Here we go.
How many? About 17. About 17. And, what, and what about the gorilla? Mm -hmm. Who's gorilla? I'm gorilla. Have you seen a gorilla? I saw the gorilla. Did you not see a gorilla? I did not see any gorilla. Well, they can count a gorilla, but you saw the gorilla. So I bought their book, actually. You didn't see a gorilla? No. Can I see that again? I, yeah, really yeah, I saw the gorilla, but I don't look the gorilla. Don't look the gorilla. It's true. <laughs> no, it's, it's true. It's, it's true. The gorilla. Look. It's true. The gorilla was small. So. That's a small. 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 Human race, especially that witness of being a witness to anything. Here he comes oh my God! Wow. <laughs> Whoa! I <laughs> was not there before. You're kidding! It wasn't in your consciousness. <laughs> oh, you it out. Yeah. It's on your retina. Unbelievable! Yeah. Did you see the girl? Yeah. Like, Whoa! <laughs> what? <laughs> that is shocking. <laughs> I, 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 I can't walking. believe that. I, this time I saw. I didn't see him walking like so many years ago. This time I saw. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened there? I mean, he was on your retina, but he wasn't in your consciousness. Like you were, that was a picture in the physics of the body, of the house, or the bed, or your retina, and you think, oh, if it's there, I'll see it. But it's not true, because your brain's much more efficient than that. So you want to be efficient, I gave you a task. Right? You're counting those balls, so the brain, the lateral genicular nucleus, is fed, it's fed backwards from the, vision, from the brain to the lateral genetic nucleus to filter out the irrelevant information. Did anybody else not see the door at all? I didn't see the door. I should not. Good. I saw something in the costume, but I wasn't sure what it was. Right. 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 That's OK. Well, I bought their book, which is called The Invisible Gorilla, ah. which has a lot of other interesting information in it. Um, <laughs> one of them was the motorcycles. You know, motorcycles, all of them have two headlights today. And they used to have one headlight. And the reason they change is because People who had a motorcycle collision and survived said in court, I saw the driver look directly at me. Now, what was happening is the drivers were not expecting to see a motorbike. were only cued for seeing two lights. And so the one light that had appeared on the retina did not appear in their consciousness. And they drove straight into the guy. And their eyes were, you're all, all, your eyes were all, you all directed, I want to tell you, that you all directed your eyes right at that gorilla. And that is, that's really lucky. Because if I tracked your eyes, you all spend time looking at that gorilla. You <laughs> were focused on the white. On the white yes, I understand. But when the black came in, your eyes surely looked at it. Like I said, they were the driver who said, he looked at me, but he drove straight into it. Because the visual system, that his brain directed his eyes, but it didn't register because you're not looking for the one light. We're only looking for two lights. Lens new meaning to the kids ignoring the lens. <laughs> right. Anyway, it's a good. So uh, anyway, so um, excessive. Now, by the way, I said I've got their book. They said there's no difference between the people who did notice the gorilla and people who didn't notice the gorilla in terms of them or anything else you can say about that. Doesn't mean we're too They didn't that. They So excessive fatigue after school. Of course, you're working so hard. You swim to see the board or ask to go close to copy off the board. Slowly, where was I? Where was I? And with or with mistakes, right? Copying off the board with mistakes and a real red light for me. I mean, again, it's on your retina, but it's not in your consciousness. And we're going to look at that a little bit later this evening. So we're looking here at copying off the board. The sort of therapy we do here would be projecting stereoscopic images on this wall, this very wall here. So right eye is seeing this with these electronic glasses, the right eye is seeing this target, the left eye seeing this target, the brain fuses them, and one of these hands is sticking out towards the kid and he has to respond. But because this is optometric vision therapy and not all optic art, we actually want to make sure it's going to be real life. So it, what's he doing? Is he's just looking? No, he's looking down, he's looking up, he's looking down, he's looking up. Now if his visual system is not so stable, I want to know that with vestibular disturbances, he can still maintain his fusion ability. Therefore, I, I ask him to keep looking down, and up and refusing 
and down and up and refusing. So nobody goes back to the classroom. It's real. And it's not just a party trip. Well, we have to do it if I see those versions this week. Do you have them like write something? Focus on writing something? And uh, no, generally, if the visual system is working okay, then if they haven't got a motor problem, then no, it's it kept moving like further and further apart. Yeah. But so you would still see it as one. That's what it's, yeah, he has to increase his vergence. He has ah. to cross more eye there, one eye there. So we're pushing, pumping the vergence ability, ability to fuse in a dynamic setting. Uh, the child uses finger or marker required to read, keep the place as a child reads, right? So I'm saying if a child came in, uh, she's left the family in New York, she's 15 years old, she's living with her uncle here, she's basically, I think, like, sounds like dropped out of school. Family, mother's very involved here in education, and the kid came and I said, she's like 50, and I said, you know, do you lose a place when you read? She goes, oh, yeah, I have dyslexia. So I said to her, well, do you, you think somebody hasn't got such good eye control movements that's going to lose a place when they read? She went home and she told her mother, I said, but I don't believe in dyslexia. You know, it's amazing what kids take out, and I felt bad, because I just said, you know, dyslexia is a reading difficulty, I just wanted to open the door to something else. Um, but it's hard when a kid's been in a school for dyslexia all their life. Now, some kids are there because of linguistic issues, which we speak about, but she was there only because of visual. So that's clear to me. There's no language problem whatsoever. I mean, developmental eye movement says down vertically, she just aced it. So I spoke to the mother in New York. She said, You know, she said, I was always suspicious. She said, I couldn't understand it. There's this severe problem. My daughter had a dyslexia. Then why was there always such a huge improvement when I put a ruler underneath the page and suddenly she could read better? I mean, how complicated could it be neurologically if that could make such a huge difference? Anyway, uh, head or body movement as a child reads across the page. We saw what it's like when your eyes don't move so well, but that's the, if you are reading, because you're motivated, you know, he's a motivated kid. Look at this kid. I mean, she's motivated. But look how much effort she's putting in. She's moving from a stomach, like one of those old typewriters, you know. Bing! He gets the end. Bing! You know, that's hard work. Of course, you know, if you don't look for those things, then even if you dwell on the test, time-wise, it doesn't interest me. You have to be, you have to know what to look for in order to be able to pick these things up. Of course, again, these are the kids who are told everything's just fine. You know, everything's fine. I mean, they say, you know, what are you coming in for? You're just wasting your time, you're wasting your money. I've got a clip of the mother saying that, I don't know where, which lecture it sent She said, I came here today thinking I was going to waste a lot of time, a lot of money, but I didn't even. First few minutes of the exam, it's clear to me how much my child had been suffering for so many years. And I'd known about this place earlier, I would have been here years ago. I call all the credit to her ophthalmologist, Dr. Kathy Bergwerk, who thereafter came to my office to see a little bit about what we were talking about. So, but prior to coming, she led, She said, I, what are you going to find that I haven't found? That was the question. So again, when people say, she's, you know, an ophthalmologist is great, so that means, what does that mean? It means, could mean they're really nice. Does it mean they have expertise in the field which you need expertise in? Their learning is not in that area. So, you know, their expertise, you go to an average ophthalmological conference of 500 hours, and there's one of 2012, I haven't looked up 2013, in 2012, there's 500 hours of lectures, 90 minutes on one lecture about vision and the role of sweat skills in education. Does she refer patients to you? Uh, not so many. She gets to come more to understand exactly the field. Like it's, you know, it's hard. The ophthalmologist, you have to do the right test to understand. You don't do the test. You don't, you don't do the motility test. You don't do the test. test. You're not going to reveal the problem. So you're going to say everything's okay. You just think it still goes on. Like it's not so easy. You know, in England, um, in England, you only refer to ophthalmologists as disease. We're legally obliged to screen out all disease. If I don't pick up disease, I lose my license. I can give antibiotic eye drops. I can treat, uh, you know, monitor diabetic. I can treat glaucoma. I can do all those things. And if I need to refer to the ophthalmologist, I'll do that. He's busy doing ophthalmology. He's not doing seeing seven-year-old kids in a, in a seat with a, with a reading problem, which is based around vision. And they're, they're body of knowledge is about disease, not about dis-ease. So that's like a funny situation. And it's not any, it's not, no ophthalmologist to blame for this. Like, Pastor Sean, they're all brilliant people. It's just, this, it's just unfortunate they're, they, they're given a job of, of finding problems that they don't learn so much about. And I wouldn't want to see an ophthalmologist who knows what I know about vision. Because if I need to see an ophthalmologist, I want him to know what he knows, what he's meant to know, his pathology. And he can't know what I know and he knows together. It's just too much. So, 
It's just the system which will hopefully change. Full posture when working close. So this little kid, you know, she starts reading, and uh, there you go. Look at that. Not so much fun, right? And you know, often these kids will pick things up in the classroom. It's usually put it, put it down, put it down. So it isn't there in prison. Like what do they do? They have it to go. Writing up writing, right? Writing is a visually guided motor task. So these are the signs for the writing problem: running up or down the hill, irregular word or letter spacing, inconsistent letter sizes, and reversing the letters. Well, I always say you want to see the children who are the harik, the one who's the to the one who's really having a problem. Of course, we all need to learn to track. I imagine children will struggle reading at the beginning. Children are going to have not the best handwriting at the beginning. When you've got your class and this one child is consistently struggling, I don't think the first place to go to is occupational therapy. I think the first place to go to is for an eye evaluation to see if, you know, if they say my hand hurts me, so then the first place to go to is occupational therapy. But if the writing is, they've got gaps between the words and these all these signs, you want to see if they've got vision, vision if it's a, you know, it's a visually guided motor task. Is a vision guiding the motor? You need to know. You need to know that. And here's an improvement in handwriting without any extra handwriting work. Merely because the patient becomes more conscious. They're more conscious. If they're more conscious, they can modify their behavior appropriate to the reality that they're more conscious of. So it's like this beautiful upward, upward spiral of ever increasing consciousness and ever increasing behavior modification in order to just get better and better. I mean, we're all wired. Everyone just forgets that the tasks are biologically unacceptable. It's like if we did that swimming thing. So everyone would forget that the task was biologically unacceptable and that this enormous, enormous industry of how to work out exactly what the problem is with these children who can't swim 100 meters in, a, in 45 seconds. But everyone had forgotten conveniently that what we're asking them to do is ridiculous. And so, so it comes to reading as well. It's a biologically unacceptable task, but everyone's forgotten that part. So we're looking, let's just start with the basics. Has this person got what it takes from a physiological basis in order to get going? I'll have time for questions at the end. Yeah. The signs and symptoms are soothing closes or covering an eye. You need to look out for that. And basically, eye exams, as I've tried to point out in the third part of this lecture, is testing for far distance vision clarity, but not the near vision, which is what's required in school. So what was that? Oh, right, yeah, right. Yeah, and that was a beautiful house. Everyone's got. Yeah, we're going to see a picture now, which uh, no one now no one can say what it is. Not because they have a problem with phonological awareness. Right, it's not a language problem. No one can't say what this is because of a language problem. And then um, this is a, a an image, uh, and right now you're seeing the closest to what is actually on the wall. Is the minute I start to talk about what's on this wall, you're going to cease seeing what's exactly on the wall. You're going to you're going to modify it, and it's going to become greatly embellished in your brain, and you will no longer be seeing what's on the wall. Because if you could see now what you're going to see in a couple of seconds' time, then you'd be able to see it now, right? There's not enough information for you here to see it, but I'm going to show you how we see with our brains. We do not see with our eyes because this is showing up on your retina, but it's not showing up in your consciousness enough. You can make head or tail of the data. Okay? And it's also true, you'll only be able to know what this is if you've once seen it in your life. If you've never seen it in your life, you still will not be able to make head or sense of it despite what I'm saying to you. So, what you have over here is an ear, and there's an ear here, here, yeah, here. and uh, there's a the mouth, nostril, nostril, at the bottom of the mouth, oh. one eye over here, one eye over here, wow. and once you've seen it, you'll never not be able to see it. Here's his head coming oh, down, wow. up over there, he gives milk, if he's, if he's female. Are <laughs> you there? Yeah. I don't uh, see you guys. I don't know. I don't see you. Yeah. 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 No, it's it. Yeah. 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 It's been a while to see. Where's the head? Here's the head. Top of the head, ear, bottom of the face, eye, eye. He's looking right at it, the middle of his face. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. See Sorry, it? guys. Kind of. See it? Oh, motion them. Yeah. I can't move. Again. Wow. It's nice again. Yeah. There's an ear there. It's a face looking right at you. Imagine it's even a human face. There's an yeah. eye here, an eye here, and his nose is here, his mouth yeah. is down there. Yeah. The top of his head is here. Her. Her. 
And the EA is down Oh, the right side of his face. No. Black part. Oh, there. Oh, there is the Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Oh, and now you see it? Right. Oh, there it is. You got it? Yeah. Uh huh. That's pretty good. You got it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, to the right side of his face. Yeah, okay. yeah. Only after the circle, there. Yeah. 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 Only after he pointed it out. So, that's how we see with our brain. So, when we ask a child to copy letters off a page, it's like, this is what it looks like the first time you give a child an ABC, right? I mean, it's all abstract forms. Everything you see on the page till then has been in a book. It's been a picture of something and something is saying, Okay, well, make kids give these names, and it's only if a kid in Gaon has understood, um, uh, let's say, direction, right? You can discern between this triangle and this triangle, and um, different angles as well here. So you need to practice, you work with shapes and things in Gaon in order to make sense. When you get to letters, you can actually make sense of these abstract symbols and then give them names, which is quite a big leap. To bring us the world of visual processing, where we're going to be looking at laterality, directionality, my ability to understand left and right, which is important, visual discrimination, memory, visual closure, visual sequential memory, visual figure ground, auditory visual situation, visual motor integration. Visual closure is what you did with the camera, like, like you filled in, right? It wasn't there. But you're able to fill in and make something sense. When you look at a caricature, that's what you're doing. Like, what is that? A few lines. It looks like a whole, per <laughs> a whole person when you see a caricature of. of uh, of the video. And there's also how quickly can we see. So here you have a tachistoscope, and that's going to flash up really quickly. And how quickly can I see those numbers? Okay. Get ready. It flashes, and you have to say what it was. Okay, try and say something. Get ready. Again, you know, because there is only the retina didn't show up in his head. So often a child is learning a lot by listening and not by seeing, because they, we'll talk about it, it's got a deflected processing style, they'll have a hard time with it. So it tells me how on you are visually. And when we read, we want to be able to look at those words very quickly and be able to make sense of them. If I said to you all now we need to learn all these all these birds' names, right? We're not so happy to do that. What's the challenge? There's a visual discrimination challenge, there's a language challenge, right? People who can do this are called ornithologists. <laughs> ornithologists in English or sapa in the grip, right? Which means your business card can be smaller when you come out of the app. Because ornithologists are quite a long word, right? But it sounds more impressive than sapa, so I'm not sure it's just that. But this is what we're doing we give kids letters to read. So they've got to learn all those small things. And some of the differences are quite small in Hebrew. Okay? Some of these differences are quite small, which in the real world would be the same. I mean, look at the apple that could not, you know, look at every little apple and make a difference. Like with those birds, we say those are birds. We look at every single little difference, but those are birds. A finch, but every little finch, you know, we have to be an expert. So again, it's not more, I just want you to understand, you have to, you have to respect the demands of what we're putting on our kids, human beings. And we ask them to discriminate and to define between these things, which until then would have been the same. A bet and a half. Anything which looks that similar would be the same. So this means a, a leap. It's no good saying, well, let's teach reading earlier. That's the solution. No. The solution is to give the kids the toys. They can feel what it means, the small differences. A little bigger, a little smaller, curved, round, these concepts. And when they look at the letters, it has meaning in their consciousness. That's really important. So the visual, we look at these words. Do you know what these words are? What's here? Man-thing and chain. We can all read man-thing and chain. So you need more visual analysis for Hebrew than you do for English. So there's a difference there, right? Chesed, Kasher, Panim. So you need more analysis. We're going to look now B and B, P and Q, right? Here's a chair. And hey, that's a chair too, right? <laughs> and uh, there's a B and there's a D. So why? Like, it's just the same in a different direction. That's a little crazy. It's all right. <laughs> Mum and dad, right? It doesn't go like that, right? It's just nothing in the world changes its name because it's in a different direction. 
That's also a, a leap. Oh, it's not so simple that she So Piaget is like seven, eight years old when a child should stop making reversals. Seven to eight years old. But five to six years old, they should start to know their right and their own left. So if a child is having troubles with B's and D's at seven to eight, often it's because they do not have a proprioceptive awareness of their right and their their own right and their own left. And so surely Gimel and Zion is the same. Now, we need to have here understand visual spatial relationships. So it's a bet I if they don't understand underneath or up to the left or inside, then how I differentiate between the bird the bar and the the beer, the the bar and the the how I differentiate between sorry there's a settle down there and then shoot. I mean it's just a shin with three dots. I need to understand to be able to to, to grasp that vision. So maybe I'll see it sequentially, right? Spatial versus sequential. If I'm looking at small areas of space, I may just see a face plus a dot. I may not be like that. Maybe in my consciousness I don't perceive that. Similarly here, I see a shin with three dots, four dots. One, two, three, four. Maybe that's what I experience. So I can't make sense of it because I don't have spatial awareness of my vision because I don't have a large area of visual attention. I've been closed down to look at small detail when I read. Sorry? You're pretty confident they're saying some sort. Right. So, I mean, it's hard to know exactly, but. <coughs> so, why do we have spelling mistakes? Why do we have spelling mistakes? The B and the D, which my daughter has problems with. Right. So, what's the. So, what's the. What's, what's, why? Because uh, she brought in a good sense of right and left. That has nothing to do with her eye or her brain. Well, well, I guess it does have to do with We only see with our brains, right? right. We see, we've seen that. We see yeah, that. Yeah. their eyes, and we get information in with their eyes. We want to make sure that the visual system, at least the visual demands of getting the information in, and then, well, what's my brain doing? So it shows on my retina, why didn't it show up with my consciousness? Yeah. That's because I'm not, I have my own right left ability is limited. So what do you do about it? So you have to treat, right? You have to train right and left awareness. And then integrate that into vision, and then you're going to have these meet in the room. That's one way. The other way is to make up all these poems about why B is this way and why B is that way. That might happen, you know, may happen in certain classes of Horam and Takenet, like you learn all these tricks which are full of lots of words and things to remember. But if vision's working well, you have to remember anything, really. So it just happens. Like the spacing, right? Keep going to say, yeah, I put my finger between every word. Why do you have to do that? I mean, just sort out your visual system and be able to understand the space. So it's a bit built to do it. If it works, it will do it. You know, you asked me before about practicing the handwriting, you know, if it works, it will do it with visual motor. I never see a problem with visual motor integration. They're either a motor problem or a visual problem. There's no visual motor integration. I never see anyone with that sort of problem. Figure ground. I haven't seen a kid with a pure figure ground problem. It's always, it's always something in their visual system which doesn't allow them to be conscious of what they're looking at on the page. You fix the vision, they get it. So why do we make spelling mistakes, right? Lamad Mil Aleph. So this is a, a chart of visual uh, visual development. So you've got here vestibular, gross motor, fine motor, ocular motor, which is the finest, of course, which moves you through the worlds of movement and touch. A baby at first has a lot of movement and touch. That's their experience. They move to auditory verbal. They start to listen. They start to imitate sounds. And finally, visual becomes dominant. And visual allows them to think and have memory and have attention, exploration. Vision allows them to, to look forward, think about where they're going. Vision allows you to, to, uh, to predict, to aspire. Right? One because I want to be uh, an accountant, let's say. One someone who's a Rosh Hashim, a teacher. He imagines the classroom, he imagines the board, and he imagines the students and the furniture. So uh, this is uh, compared to the child who I want to be a teacher. Like who's going to get there? The one who sees it and visualizes or chooses it. What's going to be the outcome of this choice? What's going to be the outcome of that choice? All these are visual tasks, but visual cortex should be should be uh, functioning whether we can do that. So really, we're visually ready here. Is it people? Is it warm? Is that can, can be okay, comfortable? Um, so this is where vision is ready. But what happens if I bring in reading when I'm not ready visually? Which happens a lot. So I'm not going to want to do it. I mean, I don't want to look at that. I can't. This is too much for me. But we say, no, you have to do it. So we make you do it, and you make an adaptation. So 
you have to sort of read accurately, and in Hebrew, anyway, you're going to start looking very phonetically, often encouraged by the teachers, and say, look at every single letter. Read every letter, which is going to close your area of visual attention down. Anyway, you haven't got a visual system which enables you to have a wider area of visual attention, and you actually make progress, right? You actually start to read accurately. It was good. Practice, practice. We say, just practice. So what you're doing is you're embedding that style. Now, I want you to think for a second. How different the experience is for a child reading every letter of ra hum, putting those sounds together with every letter to seeing Avram. I mean, it's a huge, it's a completely different ball game. I mean, it's, it's entirely different. It's entire, entirely different to get the kid to say Avram to going Avraham. Yeah, my kids will say it five times that way and they'll go, oh, Avraham, and then you keep reading. Right, what do you make sure is when they say, oh, Avraham, that they look at the word when they say Avraham, not look at you. Mm -hmm. That can make all the difference. <laughs> Because that's what you want to be able to do is to recognize the word. And they go, oh, Abraham, you say, good part of the word. They didn't get any, they won't look at any, that gives them nothing. It's only they look at the word and then say, Abraham, and then maybe the next time they're able to recognize the word. So that, so that, this is now a weak student who's had a lot of emotional encouragement because they made some progress and managed to read accurately. And now they're <coughs> saying, but they're reading so, so, still reading phonetically. Well, how, how, I mean, it's such a mammoth task. We, it's doable, but beyond developing the vision skills to enable him to pay attention to the whole world, which we, we, we do that with, you then have to make sure it's going to be integrated in the classroom on that same page, all the emotional, that he can overcome that, he can actually use it, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And so to start teaching reading, my point is to start teaching reading to a child who does not have the vision skills to support reading, it's a crime, because you're digging his own grave, I mean you're really Especially in Hebrew, really, where you can produce results. You're really potentially putting into a very bad situation. Whereas the other kids who have well functioning vision skills are starting to recognize the whole words as they're going along and they start to get it. They hear it, they see it, and they, they understand there's a new trick. So, as my friend Stephen Ingersoll, who were uh, humbled by Stephen Ingersoll because he left optometry and built a school, he has a thousand children in his school. And it's called, it's called uh, integrated visual learning, and it's a choice theory school. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, a charter school, yeah. But beyond a charter school, I can't remember if it's a psychologist. But in a choice theory school, it's the whole philosophy. It's a very impressive school, very impressive. But he says they do no phonics in their school. There's no phonics taught the approach to reading because it's, and we can't, we can't, we can't do this in Hebrew. We can't. I, I thought about it, it doesn't seem like we can do it. Maybe once they did it, but when you want to teach so many children to read, maybe the skilled kids could do it once, but now we want everyone to do this impossible thing, so no one has enough skill to be able to do it. But what he says is, why teach a child wrong in the hope that they'll do it right? That's why he does not teach phonics in his school, because you're hoping they'll make this leap. You'll be able to recognize the whole thing. Sorry? Yeah, it's a whole thing, whole, whole words. They do Spanish classes and the kids. Sorry? You can't do it either. It's just too hard. Well, that was maybe he makes sure his kids have the right vision skills to do it. something different. I don't know what he's talking about. I know what happened in California. It gets a little bit. Yeah, his school actually has some of the highest reading grades in the entire country. His is like, I guess his whole language was just getting kids to look at words and memorize. It was, I understand. It's like different. So he makes sure there are a lot of vision skills and visual awareness. And so he makes sure they start actually to recognize the patterns in words, they can read unfamiliar words as well. It's very, you can look it up. I mean, it really is. I've been to the school. I went to a seminar. That's what they told us. That was the big thing when I was teaching school. And then Pete told me to get everybody went back to college. I don't Yeah, completely different thing. We're going to get to that when we talk about reading. Yeah. Did it, uh, the whole language work at all anywhere? It did work in some places, but it wasn't. You needed it with phonics. It was like, you know, people get new ideas in, in education, and they take out everything they did before. Right. And then you go back in. It was one of those cases. From California? No, no, I'm from New York. But it was all over the States. It was not my Maybe I'll talk a bit of it later. But anyway, if you do that, so you, create, if you create the learning disability. This is actually from Stephen Ingersoll's uh, uh, seminar, this slide. And he has it for writing as well. You know. He says he has the same slide for writing. If you give a child a pen to use before they have motor competence, so then they're going to hold it wrong. 
And then you have to correct the way they're holding the pen. But you wait until they had loads of confidence, they naturally hold it right. So these are things to think about. It comes back down, that's why I like that, that parallel that I give you of swimming, which is a biologically unacceptable task. You give the person the physical ability to meet the physical demand of the task, which in our case is vision, or handwriting, they'll be able to do it. On the whole, we will have less problems, and other problems come around because the kid has to work out a compensatory strategy because they're not physiologically or neurologically mature enough to deal with the physical demands of the task that you're giving them. Um, and this is what we mean by deflective process and style and action. This is actually, um, this is like a nice example. I'm going to say some numbers, and this child has to say the numbers backwards. So why is Chai's phrase the hard one? Because you actually have to see it in your head. Backwards, right? You have to see it. The other you can do by sound. 53, 35, 38, 4. The 19 you have to see in your head. Um, here, this is my little boy. He's now taller than me. <laughs> but he, he has to say, let me just show you an example. He sees some numbers on the screen, like you're going to see now. You say, which one is the odd one out? So the numbers flash. And you say, which one is the odd one out? So yeah, there's number four there, right? Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's all you have to do. So I want to see how people, that they can do and how they do it, more interesting to me. So I see my son, he actually reads these numbers. Oh. Oh. Try again. Right, so he has to hear it, to see it, in a way. It's coming into his brain, he has to say it, because he has a deflective process as well. He's, he wants to process information auditory, despite the fact that two out of three million nerve fibers coming to our brain are coming from my visual system. So when we say, yeah, he's an auditory learner, I say it's all so the blind. So they're like that because they're visually challenged, and somewhere along the line, this human being is being visually challenged, which has forced them to becoming an auditory learner, auditory dominant. Now once you're in the world of auditory dominance as a learner, you're limited in your perception of time and space as well. You're limited to the here and now, and your consciousness isn't really going to take you to further places where you can predict and maybe think of consequences of your actions, because in the world of audition, that doesn't exist. Whereas in the world of vision, it does. Vision takes you across time. Audition takes you backwards, and if you're a composer, it can take you forwards a bit. Most people are not. Most people are stuck in audition, takes you to the world of here and now. Impulsive and uh, stimulus respondent. Like you, you just respond to what's in your way. You don't really think about the consequence of your action, which is, again, something which is a very, very visual thing and not something we think about so much. So here we go. We're moving on now to dyslexia in different languages. So far, we've spoken, just to recap, we spoke about the dominance of vision in human consciousness. And for those of you who didn't see right at the beginning, uh, you can say at the end of the little movie, which really not makes the point home. We've spoken about the visual motor skills required for getting information in. We've spoken about how they're unnatural, how uh, it's a tall order to expect everyone to read, how these visual motor skills, if they're not perfect, can really interfere with the flow of information, our ability to read, our ability to concentrate. We spoke a bit about ADD and how you can make a misdiagnosis if you're testing a kid with a visual system which is interfering. We spoke in the about what and where. And we've seen how we see with our brain and how we have to be able to carry out things like visual discrimination, visual closure, visual memory. Right when I copy off the board, that's visual memory, the ability to see it and then recall what I've just seen. Auditory visual integrations. So I'm doing a hakhtara. Someone's telling me the words in my ear, and I want to turn it into sight, into an image in my head of the words so I can write it down correctly. So I said that. It's the label. Sorry? The label. Yeah. Yeah. Now I said that we speak of phonics, phonics, phonics. So one of the major problems is this fact. 
that two thirds of all publications on developmental and since 1998 have come out of English speaking countries. And since research from dyslexic difficulties has been predominantly in English, assumptions have been made about dyslexia which are based on the complex features of that language. That's really what's happened. I mean, it's just affected a whole generation of Torah and Tekenet in this country. Because, because of this. And we're going to see how true that is. So let's look at, first of all, when people say that I'm, you know, what's it called I movement? I mean, what's the difference in reading Hebrew and English? So this is it. This is what it would be like if we read English the way we read Hebrew. So this says, this says, um, two, two, say, I, I want, I, Want right today. I want to play with Teddy. Or today I went to play with Todd. Okay. I want you to think about a few things over here. First of all, we think about how many. This is such a critical point. It's, and it, it's really critical. How many eye movements you have to make when you read this as a grade seven kid reading Hebrew? let's say, compared to the same kid reading it in English. Now you can all visualize if that was in English, right? It would be today, that might be two movements or even one, I went to play with top, let's say, don't want to play with top, it's like four items, four or five items. You compare that now to reading in Hebrew, each time you look at the left of the dot, the left of the dot, and look at the early reader. The early English reader will be very quickly looking at the whole word. Simple words, the sight words, is going to be doing that very early on in the process. The early Hebrew reader is doing exactly the opposite. They're looking at every single, every single letter, dot, is another fixation. Those two eyes are together. You know, those two eyes aren't working really well. How much is that going to be draining of the kid? I don't want to go, I told you, I haven't been asked this question, but a few people have said it recently. But this child who I examined, the mum I spoke to in New York said, you know, when she came home, she just slept for two hours after the day, just so exhausting. <laughs> so exhausting, so draining. I was doing vision therapy with a patient on Friday here, uh, with a gentleman, and he, you know, was just getting those two eyes coming together, so I felt, I feel like I've run three marathons, like a 30-year-old guy. So I don't think about that so much, you know, how tired that they're, it's a lot of refixation, and it's really high level. So it's all those refix, that's one difference, but I'm going to talk about reading Hebrew and reading English. So the early stages, the visual motor demands of reading Hebrew are much higher than the visual motor demands from reading English. We saw it also from an analysis point of view, but it's also just from the fact that I'm looking letter, 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 each one's from another fixation, I've got to move my eyes across the page and keep it together. So that's one point, which is really a big difference. The other point is this. Share is share. B is B. La is la. For a child who knows all, uh, I'll ask this question for 23 years, and uh, this is it, this is the question. For a child who you could wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, who knows every letter, vowel, combination, and is still not reading accurately, what lesson are they waiting to experience that after that lesson they'll be reading accurately? There it is, the silence. I just silent every 23 years of silence when I've asked that question. Now, if I ask that question in English, it would be a deafening response. It's what we mean. We have to teach them to read. We have to teach them when they see this, it's enough. When we see this, it's ooh. When we see this, it's oh. When we see this, it's ow. You really have to teach the child to read English way beyond knowledge of the letters and the vowel on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. There is no difficult word in vowelized Hebrew. Mm -hmm. There is a long word. There is an unfamiliar word. There is no such thing as a difficult word. So for the kid who knows all the letters and all the vowels and is still reading inaccurately in a Hebrew, you have to say vision. If you can wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and there's all the letters and all the vowels. It doesn't good, isn't they? Sit within the teacher. But I see far too many children who sitting for three years trying to move along in reading Hebrew. They can speak it. But they're all over the place. And again, you get this overemphasis on looking at every single letter. Which, if it then makes progress, that's not their problem. 
We've now created a secondary problem. They feel emotionally good about looking at every single letter. Now we've got to get them onto moving our world. Whereas you fix vision early on in that process, they'd be much better in a much, much better place. Again, these are big differences. And he brings, if you get a child, if I'm working in the UK, the US, the kid is two years behind reading, whoa, they have got so much work to do to catch up after I finish working with their visual system. And you may hear no difference in their reading unless you're very trained. You'll notice they're attending more to the words. But they may not know how to read that because they've done vision therapy, right? They've got to go to Tahara and take care of it. And they have to go to Tahara and take care of it after they finish here sometimes to build up their confidence and practice and close the gaps and get them to whole word recognition. I'm not saying there's no role for remedial teaching. Of course there is. But I want people to understand there is an essential difference in the nature of that remedial teaching, reading in Hebrew and English, and not to imagine, as people are doing, that the problem is phonological or something else, which it isn't, because Hebrew is what we call a transparent language, which means great correlation between what I see and what I say on a letter-to-letter -letter basis, which would be Greek, Hebrew, Spanish, but not English or French, where there is poor correlation. Poor correlation, and I need great phonetic awareness in order to read those other languages. So I can read that if I know English, right? If I don't know English, I can't do that. So what am I doing? What I'm doing, I couldn't read it with my eyes closed, okay? So there is some visual information coming in here. It's certainly, I'm using a whole word approach, right? If you get a child who's got a phonetic approach to reading, he will not be able to read that. So you need to be competent. Competency means two things. And you see it here. It's whole word approach. It's reckon, I know what words look like, so I'm seeing enough of the patterns there that my brain can make, so I know that word, I know that word, and I'm using language to give me the context that I can predict what the next word might be. So when I said initially that we don't use any language for the first 150 milliseconds, if you're a competent reader, you are using language because it helps you predict what the next word is. But as someone who grew up in England and could not speak Hebrew at all, I was able to read. So I don't need language to read Hebrew, actually, because it is a phonetic language. Another important point, I don't really need language. So again, it's language, it's phonological decoding, it's language, it's language. You don't need language to get on the early levels of reading Hebrew. You can read it if you don't speak a word. You can't read English if you don't speak a word. Not really. You're going to get stuck very, very soon because of the irregularities. So what enables to say, going to reach those English universities, you're not learning the word, doesn't matter. The only important thing is that the first and last letters are in the right place. Okay. The rest of your total mess, and you can still read it without a problem. This is because we've not read every letter by itself. And said, visually recognize words as a whole. What's not fair about this is you need very good language skills as well in order to be able to do this. So language is very important to be a good reader in English quite much earlier in the process than in reading than in reading Hebrew. So reading English requires a more whole word approach earlier on, it has a high demand on visual and auditory memory. So I want to be able to look at the word, and then once I've learned enough, right, for one, O-N-E, let's take that word O-N-E. So I see the word O-N-E, and someone tells me you say one when you see it. So I see the word O-N-E again, there's no clues I've got to remember that I recognize the word and what you say when you see it. You say one. That's a lot. In Hebrew, you don't need that at all. You don't have to remember anything if you want to be able to read the word accurately again. What you, you need to remember is if you want to say the whole word approach. But to start, get going, you don't have to remember anything. You don't have to remember anything. In English, you have to remember a lot. Comprehension is very important to help with reading accuracy. So good language skills. You know, as my colleague, Professor Marion Wolf, says, how important being read to is for English. You know, there's very high amount of being read to, big difference in reading ability in English if you're being read to or not being read to. It's probably true in Hebrew as well. But you can get going in Hebrew if no one's reading to you. But you're going to be a better reader than a better vocabulary. So even the whole word you have, you have language here because you have, you have to say, Matsati ish karach et krach The krach, sorry. Matsati ish karach et Kerach the Krach, you down the book in a village. Okay, that's you need good language skills if you want to read that without vowels. Which you see, I don't know. I didn't get it right at the beginning. I spent time longer still, later on don't get it right. But um, and again the picture may have helped, right? The picture also, you know, the early readers look at the pictures and that cues them into what the word might be. So that's the context, exactly. And uh, 
and then you have an English, right? So this is the same word. Again, similar thing, but much more, it's much more common. You have in Hebrew, betach, 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 the few words which are like that. But here you have the band which is wound around the room, that's polished and polished version. This is no time like the present, he thought he was trying to present the present. So he had two different meanings, pronounced the same way, and then pronounced a different way, present the present. But present, present is the same pronunciation, the same word, but different meaning. So you really need a lot of good language to get going in English. There was a row amongst the Osman about how to row. Row, row, context space. If I do not have good language skills, I will not be able to read it accurately, even if I see it correctly. So language is very, very, very important. You have here, sh, sugar, man, shun, may shun, oh shun. I get hard. <laughs> it's really hard. If the kids are uh, being raised and speaking English in the home, Shouldn't that give them a huge advantage? Yes, you said language is very, very important. Right, very important. But then when they see that's how they the crap, whatever that was, uh, you need good language skills, you have to do that, right? So you need to the, the, I brought my kids up when they spoke English at home, but they were a bit challenged on, in, in the Lashon. The, yeah, they managed, but. Uh, Lashon was a weaker side for them. You can, it's, it's always going to have some effect. If you bring up a child to be bilingual from birth, you can bring them up trilingual, quadrilingual. Uh, if you look at the research um, called The Brain That Changes Itself, it's a wonderful book um, by Deutsch. Uh, he says if you teach languages at the same time, it's like they're all first languages. Mm -hmm. Whereas once you learn another language, it's like being super, superimposed on your brain, it's very has a very different nature to it. Kind of it they make a mess out of it, but they say I have so many boxes. Right. So they, they, they sort that out. I want to say, yeah. But neurologically, it's a very different experience for the brain when they learn at the same time, whereas they're imposing another. Because there's always competitive space in the brain, that's how it works. It's like there's land available, and come, someone comes and squats on it. So it's like there's an area in the brain which is primarily, you know what we say about the brain today, it's very interesting, is once you said this is the area for this and this is the area for that, today we have to say, ideally, this would be the area for this. But if it stops functioning, another area can take over. But what you have is areas are always competing with each other for space, so if the language area is taken over, primarily the second language, it's hard to get in there and sort of use an area around it or close to it. I think it's the mother's tongue. Mum how, how a child thinks when it counts. Right, counts, right. The counting, that's what's correct. Right, yeah, yeah. Counting is, yeah, the counting for sure. It takes you straight back to that. It was primary. Mm -hmm. So reading vowelized Hebrew needs knowledge of letter and vowel sounds only. And that's the point I raised before, that silence. So the painful silence for me, the truth is. I've really lectured some real experts in the field of education, and I'm actually lecturing. Uh, at the uh, end uh, of the SAP the Brain Research Center, I've been elected there to this elementary solving the puzzle of dyslexia. I mean, I'll give you a little quick story because I just want you to understand you know, how far it's gone. There's a man um, called um, Matthew Schneps from Harvard University, he's an astrophysicist, and he recently brought out a paper on the difference uh, for dyslexia of using an iPad or an iPod, and he did a wonderful study. But there's two points which I think I, I wrote to Matthew about this, as encouraged by Professor Merriam. Here's his paper, read it. So I contacted him. What did I say? First of all, there's a paragraph which says all the subjects in the study had had um, perfect vision or control to them. So I said, Matthew, when you say in your study, I want you to know your study is going to be quoted by some organizations say there's no connection between dyslexia and vision. Why? Because in your study, all your subjects had vision, which was either perfect all controlled about, and they all have dyslexia. So, when you say vision, do you mean eyesight? Is that what you mean, eyesight? That they could see 2020? He says, yeah, yeah, that's what it was, eyesight. I said, well, there's a lot more, as you already understand, to, to eyes, to vision, than for pleasure for reading, than just having 2020 vision. So that's the first point. The second point is this, is that some of his study subjects, he had to throw out of the study, because their eye movements were so erratic as to not be able to be included in the software which he had to measure prime movements. 
And that, you know, that doesn't sort of make it. It doesn't make it in a synopsis or in the, you know, in the synopsis of the, uh, of the uh, study. It doesn't make it that some of those people, so there you have it. Some, he agrees that some of those people, they're either so off, but yet they've all got perfect eyesight because they've got 20 20 vision. So, so, so these things perpetuate themselves, also in the world of science, in the world of research, in the world of you know, academia. So that's why you know, this, I think one of those important legs I'm going to be giving is to that group at the Brain Research Center because they're trying to solve the problem of dyslexia. And I promise you, you already know more about learning related vision problems than they because then I sort of try to, then I'm missing. I lecture when I lecture at the Neuros Conference on neuroplasticity and cognitive modifiability. People are just so happy. And I think it's, it's like it's taken more the way from them. They, they, they observe so much and they can't explain in, according to their model. And it's something as simple as, well, maybe their eyes just aren't moving across the page so well. Or they can't just hold their two eyes together. So, you know, loud, loud. But, uh, so we need really Hebrew with our vowels, language will become very important. So it becomes like like reading English, right? There's no difference at that point. So good readers start off with efficient vision skills. Good readers start off with good phonological awareness. Good spellers and good readers recognize what the words look like, right? So a good speller needs to know what the words look like. Can you get the most dyslexic kid in England? I always find they can read a few words on the page. Well, why can't they read a few words on the page? But they don't look like it, they know what they sound like. If they could learn more. They would do better. And certainly, I think the most more challenging is the phonological awareness. Like I said, the kid, you know, there's, I just met someone in England, and he said, you know, his family is trying to help get this field going there as well. And he works with the national health systems. So, you know, his family is three generations of illiterates. The grandparents are illiterate, and the parents, uh, and no one cares. Uh, uh, so it's like a big thing as you're coming from Israel. People really care about other kids. You know, always, no one cares. I just don't know what you're telling you. Know. It's quite remarkable. But it's, yeah, what time the teachers got in the three generations, like, no one gets it, they don't read, so, you know. The mind boggles, I must tell you. Anyway, vision skills become less important for the competent readers when reading easy text, right? So, if I give you a text of a book which has simple words, or like a newspaper article, which is quite simple, we can take off 50% of the words and you can still read it. Because you're really using your language to predict what the next word is, you're using your vision as a little cue to to say that's the right, you know, you did well. You, to, you was verifying that your prediction was correct. Um, but if you read a more complicated text, then you're going to be much more visual. So, you know, it's not true that I, I want to know what's happening in people's lives. Like, if you're a good reader and I see your vision skills aren't so great, you're reading familiar texts all the time, then I'm saying, well, you're reading vision therapy, good one. You're doing just fine. But if you, you want to go and learn read Russian now or German or something you don't know, Oh, then I can help you make sure your vision skills are going to be good enough to be visually on. Or if you're looking at statistics on the computer and numbers and things that you can't use language, so that's a much more visually demanding task. But when you're using reading words with language, you can read that, that sort of beautiful um, reciprocal into neurological interweave between vision and language and enables you to get by if you don't actually see every word so well. Good spellers got excellent pictures of words whilst reading and can visualize what words look like. So sometimes we're going to get a good reader who's a poor speller. And when you look at their vision skills, you're going to see they have great language skills. They were motivated. They wanted to read. Maybe they were read to. So they became good readers, even though their vision skills weren't great in English. But they are poor spellers because they're not getting such good images of the words in their head. So, so that's why they can't spell. They know what the words look like. So I think this we looked at already. This is going to go wrong. As you will understand. So vision affects behavior. Yeah, you can do that maybe that little time. Yeah, when I finish, I'll read you a little poem. So vision affects behavior. Maybe we can just get it now and read it because it's relevant. Okay. I'll come back to that. When someone says, I'm well, right, he's okay. People come to me and say, well, they said my eyes are okay, so I was okay for what? <laughs> and that's the key question, right? They're okay for what? So if you thought I was going to walk home at the end of the day across the field, but I had much more uh, challenging endeavors in my mind, well, I want to know before I climb the mountain, A, that I'm fit enough, and B, that I have the right equipment before I start to think. 
And any serious mountain mountaineering instructor, it's another point, any serious mountaineering instructor would insist that his student is coming to the lesson with the physical ability and with the right equipment. Because they want they want to get over something. So again, you work in occupational therapy, you work in harmony connect, you really want to know that your student sitting in front of you does not have a physiological impairment to what it is you're trying to do in your lesson. It's not fair to you, it's certainly not fair to them. So you say that vision affects um, emotion. This is from a 19-year-old girl who's studying here in the year seminary here in this country. She from America. Um, she was actually, you know, the question of how much do the pictures cost is is the topic here. How much do the pictures cost me? To express what I've gained from the care you've shown me, I'll share what has changed from my life pre VT vision therapy. Each day overwhelmingly endless just to get out of bed, overcoming the nausea and smile instead. Not only that, but to go to school, live up to expectations, follow every rule, looking far past the classroom, eyes searing with pain, jumping out of my skin, going insane. I couldn't concentrate, didn't work, did work carelessly fast, counting down until camp while dreading each class. Feeling topsy-turvy, I frequented the halls, took a break every class, befriended bathroom walls. The world around me spun, forever dizzy. But the eye doctor said, nothing's wrong with me. Externally successful, my grades took no toll. Inside bubbled frustration, a struggle to control. Even well-meaning friends couldn't understand me, why walls posed as threats, how I yearned to be free. I knew something was wrong and couldn't be ignored, but my life just continued till I couldn't anymore. Trapped in my classroom, drowned in difficulties, all alone, overwhelmed and busy. Looking back now, it's been four long years. Four long years you've been trying to find a solution. It's mighty hard and challenging. Uh, thank you for being there. Uh, what she found in this office was the quality of the, uh, she done therapy in the States, but she found the quality of the therapists here, some of them in 13 years, 10 years, is their ability to be in tune with what was going on and modify, understand what they're doing rather than just go through a series of exercises they're doing this with the patient. She came to me and she said, I, I wasn't aware of how amazing, she just said, you got to know you got over here, she said. I was on therapy to others. This is like a completely different experience, is what she said to me. Now, with many new skills, I've been empowered to focus at ease and concentrate for hours. Without your support, I couldn't be here answering my questions with concern and care, for putting your heart into all that you do, for improving my life. Sincere thank you. Relaxing my gaze, I can finally see from never ending days I'm finally free. So, there you have how vision can affect you know, behavior. That's, a, you know, that's something you can express. I always say when you when the, when the adult patients write something like that, you know what the kids are going through and they can't they can't express it. But that's what it is for, for, for a lot of the patients who come here. So, you know, I've been told I have 20-20 vision, but I, I can't manage to copy off the board. I can't finish my assignment in time. I can't have to be a pilot, etc., etc., etc. The effect can be very, very profound on the person and on the person's family, and on the person's family is really, you know. Frustration that parents go through looking for solutions place to place. Uh, and of course, they're told, you know, vision therapies are actually the worst, you know, that's the thing is never been. And this thing is never been, unfortunately. Maybe will change. So, 60 is the number of minutes that I give to doing an evaluation on, on a patient. It takes about 60 minutes, and it's a, it's a squeeze. I have to say it's a squeeze. <laughs> but we get it done. You know, I find the information I need to be able to. Uh, answer the question whether the visual system is interfering, helping or interfering with this person's ability to show their own potential. That's my only question. Or their functional potential, their piano playing potential, their sports potential, their driving potential, or their balancing potential, whatever it is that they can only use vision for. I'd like to try and answer that question whether vision is interfering or helping with that process. Because when vision works, it leads, and when it doesn't work, it interferes. If you're seeing double vision, then it's vision which is the limiting factor in the child's ability to move forward. This is a retinoscope, which I'm using on a child with CP. She's lying on her back because that way I can relax her body and stabilize her gaze. And I'm able to check her prescription, what she needs for distance and what she needs for near, using this tool. You can't put a child at that age, she's about 19 now, this young lady. You can't use that, um, you can't put a child like that in a machine to check their eyes because they're not stable, their eyes are wandering around all over the place, etc., etc., etc. So you need to do a full evaluation which is rele relevant to the sort of kid we're getting. Oops, sorry. We do the evaluation, 
and we analyzed the findings, and the optimal solution is we let the patient decide. I had two optometrists here from Tel Aviv last week, and I told them we let the patient decide. He could have off his chair. Yeah, you have to do this, you have to do no. Certainly not. Certainly you have to present the, the potential for change, and as much as possible, let the patient decide. I mean, if it's a three-year-old kid, of course you can't, but you can take a six-year-old kid and say, are you happy you have to stay behind in a break to copy off the board? Would you like to change that? How's your football? Would you like to change that? Yeah, yeah. And you tell what can be changed. Why do you need that? Because the patient will be emotionally engaged in what they're doing. Because it ain't easy. I mean, because reading is a biologically unacceptable task, and it's the hardest thing you could possibly do with your visual system, how could it be easy? How could it be? How can anyone say a pair of glasses can just do it? What we can do in terms of therapy, yeah, you just get a pair of glasses, a bifocus, prism glasses. That's going to be the same. It's a, it's a, it's a con. You can't do it. Now, is that cruel? Is it true that some people are going to be left behind? Yeah. But we have, we can't pretend that a task is easier than it is. It is what it is. And sometimes you have to develop a person's visual system to meet the visual demands of the task. If they are going to move forward in their learning. And if you don't do that, they will not reach their learning potential, no matter what you do. Does that mean it's not worth doing other things? Yeah, you do the best you can, whatever the emotional, psychological situation allows, that's what you're going to do. But you can't pretend that doing optometric vision therapy is not going to remove some of the biggest barriers there are to the furtherance of reading ability in this field. Even if you like to pretend that, you can't pretend because this one, this is the truth. What I'm telling you this evening, this is just the bare facts. There's, there's no way around it. There's a high task, there's a human visual system which isn't so built for that, and there's often a gap, which is the one which is limiting the child's process and causing them to develop all sorts of compensatory behaviors which need not happen if they could approach the task with a well-functioning visual system. We saw that we give the right glasses, which might be bifocals and might be prisms, mm -hmm. often together with vision therapy. As Sue Barry, 47 years old, you see she's wearing a NASA shirt, right? NASA, her husband's an astronaut, went up to space in the space shuttle. Professor Susan Barry, she's a neurobiologist, and when you're in NASA, the whole family is taken care of by the NASA doctors. I've met Sue Barry three times. Her eyes were crossed after two surgeries until she was 47 years old. And she asked the doctors at NASA, anything I can do? Nah, too old. Not worth it anyway, they told her. No difference if you see with two eyes, one eye, you're not missing anything. Until she met a developmental optometrist in New York, which I must put her name down here because I can't remember it, so you can get the book. And she wrote the story, she fixed her eyes. I've seen this, yeah, her eyes are straight ahead. There's the book, Fixing My Gaze. That's in a conference I went to in Atlanta on strabism, which is a real pet subject of mine, about straightening eyeballs without surgery. Like it's uh, for me, it's the holy grail. I mean, you can't always do it, but you can you know, put those slides up and you can make it incredible changes, incredible changes. And sometimes it will enhance the surgery. So I'm not anti surgery, I refer people to have the surgery. But I think you can do a lot of preparatory work before surgery as well to enhance the out likely outcome of the beneficial of a you know, that, that increase the chances of, of a good outcome. But Sue Barry says that worse than false hope is false hopelessness. I think that's true. I think that's true. When we use, when we do vision therapy, a lot of things we like is to take a lot of data, because then we can see what sort of percentage results. We can see things improving. We can see that we're working at a level which isn't too easy or too hard, and that's very important. This is the Sanet Vision Integrator which is a very expensive piece of equipment, which is in this office, in our office in B'nai Brak. And I, I, like I said, the, the least I can, the, the minimum I have to know is the maximum you can know. But I feel that with vision therapy as well. I want to give the people who come here the best opportunity for the quickest and most efficient results. And that means engaging the child, engaging the patient. Now, if you think you, you can do it theoretically, you know, we say we some joking, see a good therapist can do a piece of string and a spoon. Now, it's true, a good therapist can do it with a piece of string, string maybe, and a bit more, two spoons, I'd say, or. But you can't engage a child with a piece of string in a spoon. You have to engage them with bells and whistles. And it's wonderful if you've got real data as well. And so you can't really do it with a string in a piece of spoon. Yeah, it's a spoon in a piece of string. You can't. Because you need to engage people, especially today when people are getting so much information and change, and they're used to 
every 10 minutes you try and do a different activity so she engages the child as much as possible. And so this is, you know, touch screen. You can see a little clip of the, of the guy doing it. And uh, this is pressing, it's a simple task, but it's, you know, it's very nice. He has to be central peripheral integration there. He has to be aware of the uh, flashing letter in the middle that he had to touch. So we opening his area of visual attention. It's not enough he looks at every letter, but every time that middle letter flashes, he has to go to it and touch it, otherwise he cannot continue. It also tells us where he's, you know, upper left quadrant, upper right quadrant, lower left, lower right. So working with head injury patients or people with lots of visual field, you can actually see where they're having difficulties. You can bias the target towards that direction. It really is a very sophisticated machine. And when you're getting the right point, you get dopamine and acetylcholine happening in your brain. It helps consolidate, consolidate the map changes. We're trying to create, we're trying to change people's brains. That's what we work on. We don't really work on eyes. We work on their brain through their eyes because that's the best way of getting to their brain. I mean, you can make tremendous changes in half an hour of work. Very, very permanent changes. With the right motivation, you set it up the system where the person, the organism, the person is visually challenged just on the edge. You have to move his eye just a bit faster, a bit quicker, and focus a bit faster, focus a bit quicker, tune his eyes up a bit better, and you can then create these neural changes and these changes in his brain which become, which become uh, permanent. And so these are different uh, different activities in different offices around the world. So Sue Barry was 47, but uh, we can go further. As uh, this gentleman, this gentleman's daughter came into my office and said, "You've got the name of I said, "Yes, I do." Marvelous. Said, I heard you lecture many years ago. Do you work with older people? I said, "I always say." As long as they're breathing, I will work with them. Wonderful, she says. Oh, it's <laughs> well, it's I was hunted for about a year at school. And you are never too old to try and start vision therapy. But you were Mr. Oppenheimer. Interesting story. I'll tell you a little bit about him. Because he's like, first thing I want to say is this. I think in term 101, that's what I never have to go to another Musashi in my life. Because you work with a person of 101 who still wants to improve himself. Amazingly, this is an amazing position to be in. Right? He wouldn't wait for the elevator to, to come. It was too too much time. He didn't have time for this. But you want to know what Yekka is. So we joke about Yekka. This, Mr. Alpine, is, is a friend of Rafael, was a true Yekka. This story will be the most Yekka. If you can think this story, the Yekish guy, then share it here tonight. So here it is. He says to me, he came from Frankfurt in 1938 to England. 1938, 2000 in England. 2000 makes Aliyah to Israel. Since 2000, even though he's a Sashar Eretz Israel, he said he would go back every Pesach with his family. He take his family from here to England to his empty dira every year so he can have Seder night. Because they we always had it. Two nights. <laughs> and we go to three in the morning both nights. Can you imagine? <laughs> Get your head around that. But they don't make them like they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> amazing story, yeah? amazing, amazing. So anyway, anyway, yeah, he worked, he started writing his memoirs after he did vision therapy. He got his two eyes working together. Every time I meet his daughter, she told me I'm still working with father. She called him father. I said, you know, you really don't have to anymore. I mean, we did it. But no, yeah, it's good for him. It's good for me. She really worked with him. And, uh, it was really an inspiration to work with him. So, um, so I did. <laughs> Unforgettable. This is a change in a five-year-old. This five-year-old is now, I think, about 19. He did five visits, five visits at five years old, just to improve his tracking skills. And that was a change in his drawing. Mother works in education. He then came back when he was about 14. He wasn't the best reader. We worked with him, and he's, then that's it. He's never looked back. He became a book book. Um, How did she even know to write him? Um, I can't remember, actually. I don't remember. But this is what we do in vision therapy. One of the things with visual motor, you all feel a lot of movement, right? Mm -hmm. But if we focus on one dot, thank you. If we focus on one dot, Hard, it'll stop the movement. If you close one eye, mm -hmm. like sort of focus hard. Is no, it really I don't see any movement. Oh, none at all. No. Wow, that's cool. Is that bad? No. 
just is. I mean, just you've got very, very stable fixation. You don't see anything. You're looking at that. Most people feel a sense of movement. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is it really around it? You don't feel this? It's zero movement. Well, different rings are moving. So you either got incredible fixation yeah. or you're. Yeah, yeah, see, see, this is a very exotic illusion. But I imagine it's a strong fixation. Most people, though, if you cover one eye and look at a dot, it will sort of freeze. And that's what we do in vision therapy. A lot of kids even had to get to the page because I feel like the words are moving on the page. And in vision therapy, you're stabilizing their gaze. And so you stop that movement. That's in the visual motor. And the other thing we do, which I indicated before, is you're reducing the amount of energy and brain space on their CPU that they're using for vision. And that's when you get, like, I you know, <coughs> you know a guy, he's got a beautiful lecture outside, but he, he's about 30, 38. And, uh, I, I was getting off the bus and he wanted to get on the bus and he didn't get on the bus. He said, I could tell you he said, You've got to see the way I I I move the bow on my chair. I mean he says you just have to see it. You just you couldn't believe it if you saw how I moved it, how it's changed. And you think, well, what's that got to do with anything? It's the same as I said before. You know, you've just freed up all that brain space. The kid goes to vision to speech therapy and they can't really focus on the therapist's face, so they can't really feel with their lips because they're visual visually engaged. You know, it's just milking the system and they can't do the other things. So that's really what causes all these other changes that people talk about. The kid I saw today said, so my maths has got much better. Like, What's that going to do? It's this. You just free up all that space and you can do a lot more than you thought you could do. And so these are some of the happy graduates uh, from the older. This guy came from England, at, I think he was four years, three or four years old. He was an amazing, amazing child. Special, really special niece. But, um, he was just a delight. So we try and get the certificates. Of course, in America, when a kid gets a certificate, it's like the cultural living. Everything stops in the whole therapy. All the children come out with their therapists for the graduate. Can you imagine how I did that here? Thank you, Mazek Ashul. But you know, it does inspire. Well, the truth is, if you can just think of it out of the box, it's very inspiring for all the other kids in therapy when there's a real graduation. So people are happy to see that as part of the therapeutic experience. Whereas I think here, I'd, be, I, I'd have to give like three hours of lectures to get people into that, into that head that they can understand it's part of the therapy's experience and beneficial to their kids. <laughs> be happy for somebody else. What? Be yeah. happy for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, you can't have it all. You know, you can't have it. So, um, you can dig a hole with your head. I mean, you can. You can get through life with a non functioning functioning visual system. You can sort of get by and maybe read it. But it's a lot easier if you have what you need. Right? It's a lot easier to dig the hole. So uh, that's really the last slide to think of this evening. And uh, there we are. We have an office here in Mishala. I want to thank you for coming. If you have questions, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. That's always a pleasure. It really is a pleasure. I enjoy what I do, really. So I'm happy to talk about it, too. But it's important. You know, I used to control how many lectures we did, but now I suppose you just go, I'm just going to give as many lectures as I can because it's too painful when someone comes to me and they say, Why didn't we hear about this till now? You know, so I do what I can. We've got the YouTube, we've got the Facebook, we've got as much as we can to, to get information out. And that's just our shame. We just need good people to, to become uh, developmental optometrists, which uh, Avi Kornoy, who runs our office in Benabra, who runs a patient there. So he's a patient, he's a therapy for seven years as a therapist, he's a degree in optometry, and now he's doing his fellowship, he's in the middle of that. So Doug William will be the third board certified developmental optometrist in this country. So questions, yes, please. Yeah. What was what did VIL stand for? For what? It was on some of the slides on the top, it says like VIL something or another. Oh, uh, visual interferences to learning. Okay. And then another question was so you're saying like if somebody learns, let's say, two languages at once from a young age, then learning a third or a fourth is much easier. No, if they learn at simultaneously, there seems to be no limit to how many languages you learn as long as you learn them all as if they were your first language. From a very young age. Right? Yes, at the same time. If the one father speaking in Yiddish and one father speaking in Hebrew and one thing speaking in English, from the time the child is the baby, their, their brain will sort out the various languages and they will speak them all at a very high level. Ah. If they then try and learn later a fourth language, it'll be a very different experience. Okay. Yes. What would account for a child uh, reading a complex text and having no problem with some of the complex words and stumbling on 
feels like was and saw. Yes, so was and saw could be a. Uh, I mean, they're going to read was and saw or saw and was. Right. I mean, they'll be beautiful about you know all these large you know longer words, and then they'll stumble on the smaller easier words. Well, it could be the longer and more complicated words increase the actual visual attention because they realize it's more challenging. So there was a study done um, <coughs> in the Haifa University. Um, I can't remember the name of the lady I met for that. And they found that giving competent readers smaller text improved their reading comprehension because they became more visually aware. So it's more visually challenging, but increased their state of arousal and attention. So maybe that when they come to the complicated word, they're more visually aware, they understand they need to be more on. Mm -hmm. And then what they may be using then is maybe language prediction, like we spoke about before. And they're less visually on, and they therefore say the wrong word, maybe. Mm -hmm. That's eventually. I'm, I've sent Kate, I've sent students to you. I'm wondering, of the people you see, like what percentage is it mostly the vision therapy? What percentage you think it might be reading problems might be a mix? And what percentage it might be something else and it's not? Like of what you're seeing, how, how, how does it interplay? Like, the difference? I mean, you can't get ratio, but what are you seeing? Well, Talcott and Stein, this is a rather early stats, was they said 80% of kids with learning difficulty have, this is in English, I'm going to modify the statement, but they say 80% of kids with learning difficulty so 20% of them, um, there's a visual component. Okay. Sorry, 80% have a visual component. The 20% is only visual. Okay. The 20% is only phonological. And the other is a mix. Mm -hmm. Now, that makes a lot of sense to me in English. But I would, I would say, like I said before, but the child knows all the letters and all the vowels. Mm -hmm. um, and they're still at 3 o'clock in the morning, etc. How many of them are really inaccurately because of phonological problems? Can you say the numbers again? That was 80% and 20 and 20. Wait, so 80% have a visual component. Visual. 20? It's only visual. Mm -hmm. And 20 is only phonological. Of the 80? Yeah. But you said that 80% have a visual. The 20% of those 80 is only visual. 20% is only phonological. So in 80%, there exists a visual component to their problem. So how is the that? That is the 20%. Without, is that the 20% of the 100% that's only phonological? Uh, 16 and 16. 20 of the 80s. 20 of the 80s. So 16 of the whole. Yeah. 20% yeah. of the 80% of kids with learning difficulties. Yeah. 20, 20, sorry. 80% of the 100, let's say 100% of the kids with learning difficulties. So I look at that. So for 80% of them, they have a visual element to their problem. Mm -hmm. Of that 80, yeah. of that 100, 20% is only phonological. So 60, no, 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 no. Sorry, you're right. There's a 20% rate of the X100, yeah. Okay, so 20, okay. Of the 80% have got a visual, 20% is only. And then 60% have a mix. Yeah. The other 20 is only phonological. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what I saw when I said. Yeah, that would be correct. Um, so in the Hebrew, it generally mean reading slowly. Mm -hmm. That rapid automatic naming, which is the biggest predictor of dyslexia, is reading slowly. They read those numbers slowly, and that's quite a hard one to. That's the hard one of the harder challenges, you know, to build up that speed. Is you would say, no, it's mainly phonological. It's reading slowly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. someone read read those numbers. They develop the language. They read the numbers slowly. If they know the numbers, once you know the letters and all the vowels, you should be able to read active. If you're reading inaccurately, it's not phonological. If you then get to the whole word stage and you're reading slowly, that may well be phonological. Because I see the word, but it takes a while to say the word. But there's no reason why a kid with a phonological difficulty has to remain a phonetic reader. They too can become whole word readers. They just will they, read. They, they read it first, they right, but they still might read slowly. Okay, if you didn't introduce yourself to me previously, so you please do before you leave, like the name was here. And uh, we, send out, we send out newsletters, and if you'd like to be on that list of the newsletters, uh, professional yeah, newsletters, you can send you an email or give you a link to email. Uh, so and that's a story. <laughs> Thank you.
I find that people who meet you are often the least of them. Oh. She was so nice. I heard from her that woman who ran it was incredible. I don't know if things I need to touch with. Oh, that's great. You said something about to fill in? She needed to fill in for oh, somebody. Okay. I gave everybody, she posted it. I gave him oh, He said, No, I know my mom did this. I thought it was an example. I'm okay. I'm happy with his son. Yeah, he's my mom. He's a good friend and his brother, but it may be different. I've sent about five people to him. I think we know. Two of them really react. Yeah. Yeah. What's your other one? Yeshua Jersey. He's an okay. If you ever want to talk to him, he knows about why you see him here on your show, right? Yeah, we're here also. Yeah. 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 It's just my mouth. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I thought you were in this area now. Well, I believe in it. It's, it's, like, it's like Paul Andrews. It's like everything helps. Some kid. Some guys. It's like, you know, the people get so. Yes. Like he's not, he's just married to theories. They have to get this way, just to get that way. Yeah. Okay. They look like a balance of everything. Is it really good? You know, and everything.
Thank you. 